Elon Musk with $164 billion. Uh, but after all the turmoil at his companies, uh, that made a dramatic dent in his wealth. From the small luxuries like owning some of the best cars in the world to the unbelievable ones like owning an entire town, Elon Musk has it all. The Tesla CEO has shocked the world by becoming the ultimate richest man in the world, valued at a whopping $260.8 billion. Alongside that, he has broken the record for the longest standing CEO of an automobile company, which is Tesla. But when he's not busy running his companies or building a conglomerate, he indulges himself in the most luxurious lifestyle. And today, we will be looking at just what Elon Musk owns to understand the billionaire lifestyle of the richest man in the world. Elon Musk just made the most surprising purchase of all time. He and his associates acquired over 3,500 acres of land in Bastrop, Texas. The land, which lies 35 miles outside Austin, has been named Snailbrook, referencing the boring company's mascot. And the vision behind the land acquisition is actually a Texas utopia along the Colorado River. Elon said the land would develop into a utopian town that would feature prefabricated homes with amenities such as a pool, outdoor sports area, gym, and a charter school. But this isn't Elon's only shocking land purchase. Back in 2021, Musk announced plans for another city, Starbase, in Boca Chica, Texas, approximately 350 miles from Snailbrook. These heavy land investments and town creation projects were attempts to address the high cost of living for SpaceX and the boring company workers, especially as SpaceX employees have a significant presence in Boca Chica. However, Musk also has plans to build a private compound nearby for his residents. This proof of his extravagant lifestyle mirrors his entrepreneurial success, with indulgences ranging from designer fashion and exotic cars to private jets and lavish holidays. He made headlines last summer when he was spotted chartering the Zoo Superyacht in Mykonos, Greece. Renowned for his high-profile lifestyle and luxury travels, Musk made headlines last summer when he was spotted chartering the Zoo Superyacht in Mykonos, Greece. The yacht is a very impressive 79-foot vessel, operated by the most luxurious yacht charter company, Northrop & Johnson. Elon easily made the headlines as its sleek design and lavish amenities captivated onlookers. It boasts of four luxurious cabins accommodating up to eight guests and a modern minimalistic interior design that creates a spacious and comfortable ambiance. Its expansive outdoor deck space, sun deck with sun loungers, jacuzzi, and spacious dining area allow for the most comfortable and relaxing vacation which Elon was seen having. During his adventure, he reportedly explored the Greek islands, enjoyed its stunning scenery, and visited some local hotspots with the yacht. And the shocking thing about all this is the fact that the daily renting of the yacht alone costs a fortune of $7,171, which Elon spent in a heartbeat to have a luxurious holiday. But his lifestyle wasn't always this opulent. In fact, he wasn't even born into a rich family. Elon was born to a South African father and a Canadian mother on June 28, 1971 in Pretoria, South Africa. He first showed signs of entrepreneurship and a love for computers when he crafted a video game at the age of 12 and successfully sold it to a computer magazine. However, his environment didn't let him thrive because of the apartheid in the country. So in 1988, when he acquired a Canadian passport, Elon decided to leave South Africa. His unwillingness to endorse the apartheid through mandatory military service and his pursuit of enhanced economic prospects led him to the United States. And so, his new journey began. Elon first enrolled at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, eventually transferring to the University of Pennsylvania in 1992. There, he diligently studied and ultimately graduated with bachelor's degrees in both physics and economics in 1997. Thinking his path was in academics, he ventured into graduate studies in physics at Stanford University, California. However, in just two days, he dropped out from Stanford after just two days when he discovered he was sitting on a potential gold mine. Actually, he created this gold mine back in 1995 when he was still in university. He founded Zip2, a pioneering company that provided online newspapers with invaluable maps and business directories. The success of Zip2 was massive, and just four years later, it was acquired by the esteemed computer manufacturer Compaq. The acquisition fetched him an impressive $307 million. This was the starting point of one of Elon's biggest projects. With the ideas and newfound money he had, 
he entered the realm of online financial services, establishing X.com. This venture eventually metamorphosed into the widely recognized PayPal Today, a platform that facilitates online money transfers. And shortly after he created it, eBay acquired it for a huge sum of $1.5 billion in 2002. His billionaire lifestyle began here. One of the most beloved cars from his collection was purchased after this acquisition by eBay. His McLaren F1 was purchased for approximately $1,000,000, just after the sale of PayPal. This car became a notable part of Elon's automotive journey, and it almost cost Elon his life as well. Fortunately for him, the car merely crashed, and he and his friend Peter Thiel came out unscathed. But that mere incident changed his perspective on things, and the billionaire lifestyle took a backseat again. His quest for transformative ventures continued to grow, and this time, he dived into something entirely different. Due to his resolute belief that the survival of humanity meant becoming a multi-planet species, he founded Space Exploration Technologies aka SpaceX in 2002. Elon's vision for SpaceX was basically the development of more cost-effective rockets, and this endeavor materialized in the form of the Falcon 1 which was launched in 2006, and the larger Falcon 9 which was inaugurated four years later in 2010. These rockets were meticulously designed to substantially undercut the costs of their competitors which they did. But the major breakthrough came in 2018 with the unveiling of the Falcon Heavy. This marked a huge milestone for SpaceX, boasting a payload capacity of 117,000 pounds to orbit, which was nearly double that of its largest competitor, the Boeing company's Delta Ivor Heavy, at a fraction of the cost. Elon also revealed the Super Heavy Starship system as the potential frontier of the SpaceX company. He envisaged it as a paradigm-shifting successor of the Falcon Heavy. The system would encompass the Super Heavy first stage, capable of lifting a remarkable 100,000 kilo to 220,000 pounds to low Earth orbit, with the Starship serving as the payload. Beyond its orbital capabilities, the Starship is also envisioned for expedited Earth city transportation and the establishment of bases on both the Moon and Mars. The inaugural test flights of the Super Heavy Starship system began in 2020, and it served as a proof of Musk's unwavering commitment to advancing space exploration. He also shows commitment to the vision of SpaceX and space exploration by taking on the role of chief designer in addition to his role as CEO. He oversaw the development of not only the Falcon rockets but also the Dragon spacecraft and the groundbreaking Starship, and in turn, SpaceX's contributions have extended beyond ambitious space exploration goals to solid contributions like the contract to construct the lunar lander for astronauts slated to return to the moon by 2025 as an integral part of NASA's Artemis space program. But Elon wasn't only building SpaceX back then. He took an interest in the potential of electric cars which he subsequently turned into the automobile company, Tesla, in 2004. Originally it was founded by Martin Eberhard and Mark Tarpening, but it later emerged as a beacon of innovation under Musk's guidance. The transformative journey began in 2006 with the unveiling of the Roadster, an electric car that was unconventional at the time, as it embodied the characteristics of a sports car. With a remarkable range of 245 miles on a single charge and the ability to accelerate 60 miles per hour in under four seconds, the Roadster marked a huge leap in Tesla's future. But Tesla's trajectory reached great heights in 2010 when it secured approximately $226 million in funding. From then on, Musk manufactured groundbreaking models, including the highly acclaimed Model S sedan in 2012 and the luxurious Model X SUV in 2015. Notably, the Model 3, unveiled in 2017 as a more economically accessible option, surpassed all expectations and became the best-selling electric car in history. With the achievement of this huge feat, Musk picked back up his abandoned billionaire lifestyle and made a lavish purchase. Musk purchased a huge mansion in the upscale Bel Air area of Los Angeles, valued at a combined $17 million. The mansion boasts an expansive 20,428 SQFT with amenities such as a gym, seven bedrooms, tall ceilings, a wine cellar, and a swimming pool. And it was only the first of the four Bel Air mansions he purchased. His second purchase was the acquisition of a ranch house previously owned by Gene Wilder, which he turned into a private school for his children. 
In a Vogue interview, he whimsically described it as resembling a little schoolhouse on the prairie, though it was situated in the affluent Bel Air neighborhood on a golf course. The Bel Air mansion spree continued with his acquisition of two additional properties, one which was an under-construction mansion purchased for $24.25 million according to Variety, and the other which was distinctive. According to a 2013 Business Insider report, was valued at a combined $70 million. His diverse and opulent real estate portfolio reflects Musk's inclination to luxury living. Eventually, he put his innovative and entrepreneurial vision behind, instead, choosing to focus on running his three companies and living a life of luxury. He began to dress rich, indulging in expensive fashion unlike other famous CEOs. Unlike Steve Jobs, who sought Issey Miyake's expertise to craft a discreet black turtleneck, and Mark Zuckerberg, with his iconic gray t-shirts which projected a free-spirited CEO persona, Elon Musk was different. He was less inclined to conform to these established norms of the minimalist looks of tech CEOs. Instead, he collaborated with designer Emily Don Long to revamp his wardrobe around ruggedly masculine icons like young Harrison Ford and Paul Newman. His most notable look was in 2018 at the SXSW in a vintage leather pilot's jacket and engineer boots. He sought to evoke the spirit of intergalactic exploration while discussing the necessity of colonizing Mars with that outfit. And over the years, his fashion sense has evolved. He developed a swaggering signature style, and he is believed to no longer work with a stylist. A recent sighting in April showed Musk in a video at a SpaceX facility where the wind billowed his oversized graphic t-shirt around his tapered black jeans. But fashion isn't the only thing Musk has a passion for. His fervor for automobiles is also evident in his collection of exotic and high-performance vehicles, which have most of the world's most prestigious automobile brands. One notable car in his collection is the Jaguar 1967 E-Type, which is a classic convertible. And although Musk's experience with this particular Jaguar has been less than ideal, it is a notable part of his automotive collection. In addition to it, he has a fleet of everyday cars that scream luxury. The Audi Q7, Porsche 911, and BMW M5 sports car have a spot in his garage, which showcases his appreciation for performance and versatility in his choice of vehicles. But as the owner of Tesla, Musk's electric car collection extends beyond conventional cars. He is the owner of the Lotus Esprit submarine car used in the movie, The Spy Who Loved Me which was acquired at an auction for $920,000. However, his innovative ideas and entrepreneurship spirit kicked in again when he made his plans to acquire Twitter public in April 2022. But way before he made his plans public, he had been a part of the company from the sidelines. He joined the social media platform in 2009, swiftly amassing a substantial following which exceeded 85 million by 2022 under the username Elon Musk. But his acquisition plan of Twitter was very difficult to actualize, especially because of the many controversies he created on the app. In August 2018 he made a series of tweets proposing the privatization of Tesla at $420 per share, with claims of having secured funding. This led to legal repercussions as the US Securities and Exchange Commission SEC, filed a securities fraud lawsuit against Musk, stating that the tweets were misleading. And despite the initial resistance from Tesla's board, Musk eventually had to reach a settlement that included relinquishing his chairman role for three years, pre-approval of his tweets by Tesla lawyers, and fines that totaled $20 million. Beyond personal controversies, Musk extended his engagement with Twitter by criticizing their policies regarding the principles of free speech, particularly because of their content moderation policies. By April 2022, his involvement moved from mere tweets to the acquisition of over 9% of Twitter's shares. This move was a bid to acquire the entire company, initially valued at $44 billion and later revised to $54.20 per share. Twitter's board surprisingly accepted Musk's bid, envisioning him as the sole owner. And Musk wasn't quiet about it. He made ambitious plans for the platform, stating his intentions to enhance it with new features, make algorithms open source for increased trust, combat spam bots, and authenticate all users. But his plans were short-lived, because by July 2022, Musk opted to withdraw his bid, citing inadequate information on bot accounts and stating that Twitter was in material breach of multiple provisions of the purchase agreement. A legal battle ensued, 
which led to Twitter's shareholders voting to accept Musk's offer in September 2022. Thus, he became the new CEO in October 2022. He wasted no time implementing significant changes as Twitter's owner. His initial actions were substantial layoffs, the introduction of a subscription service allowing users to purchase blue checkmark verification for $8 monthly, and the dissolution of Twitter's content moderation body. He even reinstated several banned accounts, including that of former U.S. President Donald Trump. But unlike his other companies which were on the rise because of his investments and decisions, Twitter faced challenges. The advertising revenue dropped significantly because companies were not in support of Musk's ownership, so they withdrew ads in response. But Musk remained undeterred and redefined the platform by renaming it from Twitter to X in July 2023. Despite his plans, he has not been able to do much since he became CEO due to the series of controversies that he is currently navigating. He has a potential $1 billion penalty related to his earlier withdrawal from a $44 billion bid to acquire Twitter. Additionally, he faces allegations of an affair with Nicole Shanahan, wife of Sergey Brin, his longtime friend and co-founder of Google. Furthermore, news emerged that Musk secretly fathered twins with Siobhan Zillis, an executive at Tesla. And all this happened within the past 30 days. Musk is also being accused of fostering a toxic culture of racism and sexism within the companies he leads. On June 15th, both former and current black employees at Tesla filed a lawsuit alleging racial discrimination. This came after Musk paid $250,000 to settle a sexual misconduct claim against him in 2018 from a SpaceX employee. Despite these scandals, he has managed to remain CEO to all his companies except Twitter, which he voluntarily resigned from in June 2023. Since then, Elon Musk has reclined into his comfort and allowed only exclusive access to himself as opposed to his initial free access persona. Most recently, Musk confirmed that he would be attending a gathering organized by Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney's right-wing political party in Rome. Musk also reportedly accepted the invitation to be a guest at the Atreju Festival, which is a four-day event, also organized by Maloney's people. This exclusive access has also made Musk meet more famous people who have, in turn, gifted him some of the most expensive things. Renowned celebrity jeweler Ben Baller recently created a unique diamond ring adorned with Tesla's name and logo as a gift for Musk. In an Instagram post, Baller expressed his admiration for Musk's inspirational role and credited him with motivating both himself and his friend Paul, who also owns a Tesla Model X P100D. This custom-made Tesla ring, valued at $37,000 according to Baller, marks the first ever instance of the jeweler gifting a personalized piece to anyone. In his Instagram message, Balor also stated the significance of the gift. He attributed it to Musk's role in inspiring people to elevate their endeavors and push boundaries. Also, the gift was to commend Musk for his contributions to the American job market, with him providing nearly 50,000 jobs and re-establishing America as a strong player in the automobile industry. In addition to his indulgence of luxury jewelry, he travels lavishly. Musk travels in only his private jets, which can afford him the level of comfort and luxury he needs. His private jet fleet is huge and comprises two Gulfstream models registered at Falcon Landing, an LLC associated with SpaceX and Tesla. The Gulfstream G5550, which is his latest addition, has a passenger capacity of 17, but has been customized for a sleeping configuration. But the G650, which is one of the other aircrafts in his fleet, boasts of a larger size and flies faster, which makes it Musk's favorite jet for his journeys from California to Texas. His private jet preference for travel underscores his commitment to the luxurious and billionaire lifestyle. During his travels, he pampers himself even more by opting for stays in only five-star hotels. These accommodations, which are renowned for their impeccable service, top-notch amenities, and exquisite lodgings, always provide him with a haven of comfort and extravagance in whatever place he journeys to. He only makes exceptions on extremely hectic days to take on unconventional sleeping arrangements like resting on the floor in the conference room or on a couch at his factory. Besides those days, his overall lifestyle reflects hard work, opulence, and luxury in the best ways possible. Well, electricity is going to be extremely high. Are you optimistic about the global economy or pessimistic? Pessimistic. The official policy of China is uh, that Taiwan should be integrated. 
One does not need to read between the lines. One can simply read the lines. Even assuming the, the sort of current economy, economic usage, electricity per capita being uh, constant, you're looking at roughly a tripling of electricity demand. If you say, like, there's really only one thing that matters from an environmental standpoint uh, for carbon, which is that we are taking uh, billions, eventually trillions of tons of carbon from very deep within, under the earth and putting, transferring it to the atmosphere and oceans. That's, the, that's actually really all that matters, is taking vast amounts of carbon from underground where it's buried and moving it into the atmosphere by burning it. And if you do that for long enough, eventually, you will get to climate change. The Chinese economy and, and the, global, the rest of the global economy are like conjoined twins. Uh, it, it would be like trying to separate conjoined twins. That, that's the severity of the situation. I'm simply saying that that is their policy, and I think you should take their word seriously. We've had a government, I'm talking about the US now, that in 2000 made an $8 trillion deficit. And today we have a $33 trillion dollar deficit. So the deficit's grown by more than a trillion dollars each year over the last 23 years. That is highly inflationary. The balance sheet of the Federal Reserve um, is highly inflationary. And so all these different measures um, are much more structural, much more difficult. So as a result of that, interest rates are going to remain higher. Opportunities for investors are going to be able to be very patient. Um, you could do nothing and enjoy a positive return. In anything that is a product or a service where there's not artificial uh, scarcity created, such as like, I want to live exactly in, you know, neighborhood houses. It's like, okay, well, there's only a hundred houses there. So, you know, that, that would still have scarcity. Um, or a unique artwork would have scarcity. But anything that does not have scarcity that we, def that we deliberately designed to be scarce, will be plentiful for everyone. If you just do the rough back the envelope uh, math, um, you need to roughly triple electricity um, to get to a fully electric economy. Um, you know, roughly a, a third of power is electric, and then uh, you know, rough, these are very rough numbers, roughly a third is, is spent in transportation um, of various kinds uh, with, with the fossil fuels or hydrocarbons, um, and then roughly a third is heating. Um, and I don't know if you've noticed, but every economist in the world now is now saying it's a soft land landing and it looks like we've avoided a recession, which all leads me to believe we are absolutely headed for a recession. Um, it's going to happen, I think, in the first half of next year, and it's two primary drivers. There's a lot of little ones, but I mean, there's a bunch of little ones. Student loan repayments are about to begin again, which puts a drag on people. Um, uh, debt. Uh, your, I mean, the interest rates uh, acceleration here, 525 basis point acceleration in interest rates really hasn't been felt in the economy. Mm -hmm. And every month, more and more people have to refinance their house and ha are wake up to a mortgage rate that's uh, mortgage interest payment that's 40% higher than it was. There is fundamentally an issue that's coming to a head with Taiwan. And it's unclear when exactly push will come to shove, but it seems that there's a good chance push will come to shove. It's trending in that direction. Um, I dread to think what would the, what they would happen. The results would be for the global economy would be absolutely catastrophic. But um, you know, China has been very clear about its goals on China and uh, sort of um, including Taiwan um, as, as part of China. So one does not need to read between the lines. One can simply read the lines. They are very clear. You have a political, you have a monetary, you have an, a, a conflict type of environment. At the same time, you have the greatest inventiveness. We talk about this fabulous technology development that has so much potential right. to um, produce wonderful things, and then it also it, it's a, it could be a problem. So if you take the time horizon, the monetary policies that we're going to see and so on will have greater effects on the world. And you look at the world gaps, so you can, it's difficult to be optimistic on that. Well, there's even more that comes out of China. Um, so China does a lot, so much of, of the world's um, heavy lifting on manufacturing, especially if made, the manufacturing is, you know, simply hard work and, and say not, not particularly glamorous. Um, China just does an immense amount of hard work. 
um, that people, most people have no idea how much hard work they do. If effectively a recession is kind of you roll the dice and a six comes up, it's a recession for 12 or 24 months. And you, some people would argue recession is healthy. We've been rolling the die 15 times and it's never come up six. We're just due. We're just due. And it looks as if a lot of different things are going to potentially dampen the economy and that we'll have two quarters straight of negative GDP growth and then the other things. China and the rest of the world being conjoined twins from an economic standpoint will mean that the separation is going to be dire indeed. That happens. I hope it does not happen. And there's no easy solution here. But if there's any, if there's any path to a diplomatic uh, solution, we should really uh, take that seriously. But the other stuff, it's anecdotal. I was at this conference yesterday, the Nordic Business Forum. Mm. I was just speaking to a lot of different businesses and you can tell things are starting to feel a little wobbly. And even, you know, even weird stuff. I travel a lot for the first time. I'm starting to see these crazy prices start to come down. So it just feels to me like the economy is starting to grind a little bit and starting to slow down. And I think when we wake up in six months and another 10 or 20 percent of households have had to refinance their mortgage at much higher rates. But it is a tremendous amount of hard work, uh, as everyone here knows, uh, to actually uh, put that generation in place um, and then transport it to where, where it gets used uh, and then dealing with the, the, the peaks and then taking advantage of the valleys of power production. And then all these, I, I just, I, it strikes me we are due and uh, I would bet it's first half of next year. But you know what? The great thing about recessions is they always happen at and the great thing about them is that they always end. So are you expecting a hard landing or a soft landing in the United States or you just can't project? I would, I do not, we will not see a hard or a soft landing in 2024. Um, the amount of fiscal stimulus that is just entering the economy, which is very inflationary. The CHIPS Act, the IRA, and the Infrastructure Act, about $970 billion. The largest peacetime non-pandemic moment of fiscal stimulus. At the same time, our central bank is trying to arrest the economy. And there was a recession, and he got fed up and turned it back to the bank. You could move in and buy it for, for at a great rate. The bottom line is, catastrophe or economic strain, not even catastrophe, is a rebalancing of power from the old to the young. And we've decided that if 1.2 million people die, that would be bad, i.e. the pandemic. But if the NASDAQ went down, that would be tragic. So we're going to spend mm -hmm. trillions of dollars propping up boomers and capital. Well, there's, I mean, there's fundamentally um, three, three pillars uh, to a sustainable energy future. Um, one, you know, one is sustainable energy generation, which is uh, solar, wind, um, hydro. I'm actually, you know, a, a fan of, of nuclear. Basically, it, it, any electricity we say, okay, this is not going to meaningfully change the chemistry of the climate and oceans, you know, the atmospheric oceans. And so, um, anyway, so you've got sustainable electricity generation on one side, then you've got um, stationary batteries as the third pillar, second pillar, uh, which, uh, is needed for any kind of intermittent uh, electricity production, and by its nature, uh, solar and wind are intermittent. Um, so batteries and solar and wind go together extremely well. Um, and uh, and then the third pillar is electric transport. Even if you take all of the like all the steam engines and everything and divide that by total number of humans, um, power usage per human, uh, thermal, electrical, or otherwise, um, was minuscule 200 years ago, and even less. Of 300 years ago. Now it is uh, incredibly high um, and it is rising. Um, and, and this is, and, and you're going to see, I think, a lot of electricity usage by um, the sort of neural net uh, data centers as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. the heavy power draws. Um, in fact, I think one of the scaling constraints for AI is going to be power availability. Um, that they are quite power hungry. So you've got, you've got um, basically uh, average energy usage uh, per person increasing dramatically um, and a transition from uh, burning hydrocarbons to things that are more sustainable. Anyway, the point is, uh, is it's going to be 3x uh, current. Um, and I think that 3x number is probably, probably happens around 2045.
fish. So this is the thing about exponential uh, growth is it, it really is counterintuitive. We've actually gotten very good support in China. Uh, Tesla has the only uh, fully foreign-owned car factory in China. Mm -hmm. um, and we do very well in the domestic market in China. Um, and our, our, you know, our Shanghai factory is our highest performing factory globally. So it's a, it's a very impressive team that Tesla has in China. And, mm -hmm. um, the work ethic there is incredible. Um, you know, we are entering a phase where U.S. Will, will not be the biggest economy in the world. Um, and, and there's nobody alive today who can remember when the United States was not the biggest economy in the world. So it, it is a, it's going to be a little um, probably discomforting at first uh, to, to a lot of people to have uh, China be probably you know, two or three times the size of the U.S. economy. China is actually, of any large country, the most forward leaning uh, yeah. with sustainable energy. Um, so they have massive solar projects, wind projects, and um, have done the most with respect to electric vehicles of any uh, large country. Of, of, of smaller countries, Norway is uh, the leader, but um, for any larger, very large economy, it's, uh, China is by far the most uh, forward leaning for sustainability. Well, I mean, the, the aspiration with these various things is to maximize the probability that the future is good for civilization. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, the future is just a set of probabilities. Like we don't know, you know, for sure what's gonna happen. I think uh, as long as American consumers uh, hang tough and continue to do their part, uh, continue to spend, I, I think the American economy can, will continue to move forward. And, you know, all the factors that you consider when considering consumer spending look pretty good. Uh, lots of jobs, you mentioned the 4% sub 4% unemployment rate. Uh, real, uh, wage uh, growth is now stronger than the rate of inflation because of the throttling back of inflation. I, I speak as someone who is very much, very much an environmentalist. I believe in having, building a sustainable future for the world. I think that there are very few people who, as an individual who have done more than I have for, to help the environment with electric cars and solar and uh, batteries to create a sustainable energy future because we absolutely need a sustainable energy future. But there is an aspect of the environmental movement that I think has gone too far. Really said from you? Yes, so said from me, I think I am objectively one of the world's leading environmentalists in terms of doing things. I not say so. Like I, I'm an environmentalist who does things. I'm of talk, of action, not talk, I act. So, so I feel I can say as as an environmentalist, that the environmentalist movement has gone too far. And in that, if you, in the natural extension of the environmentalist movement, if you go too far, you start to look at humanity as a bad thing. You start to look at humanity as though we are a plague on the surface of the earth, as though humanity is a bad thing. And in fact, there are some people who think and, and say explicitly that, in fact, there was on the front page of the New York Times, there was a guy who said, there are eight billion people on earth, it would be better if there were none, which is crazy. Now, I think the climate change alarm is a little somewhat overblown in the short term. It's still a concern in the long term, but I think it's exaggerated in the short term. Great. Now, I have to try to thread the, the needle here between what, like, what is pragmatic and what is sensible, what really matters and what doesn't matter. What really matters is that over the long term, over the course of the next several decades, that we gradually reduce how many millions and billions of tons of carbon that we move from underground and to the atmosphere because we're running sort of a climate experiment that is dangerous. But I also don't think that I think of it as a fundamental civilizational risk. It, it is, it's not going to destroy life on Earth, it's not gonna destroy humanity, but it will create hardship if you change the climate over many decades. So it's, I think my, my, my message is like, I think much more pragmatic and I think correct and sensible. And I, and I don't think we should demonize oil and gas. I think we should say, look, that is obviously necessary in the short term and the medium term too. And it'll take several decades to become sustainable. So I think if we just, without getting too worried about it, seek to have a sustainable energy future gradually, then that's what will happen. And so but I think that some of the environmentalist movement has, is part of what is causing people to lose hope in the future. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, that we should have hope in the future. We should be excited about the future and we should build the future we want. Only in America. Right, only in America, I agree, absolutely. One of the things that does concern me is that there are very few people alive today who actually uh, viscerally understand the horrors of war. 
at least in the U.S. I mean, obviously the people in on the front lines in Ukraine and Russia who understand just how terrible war is. Um, but how many people in, in the West understand it? Um, you know, my grandfather was in World War II. Uh, he was severely traumatized. Uh, all his friends were killed uh, in front of him. And uh, he would have died too, um, except they randomly gave some, I guess, IQ test or something. And uh, he scored very high. Um, now, he was not an officer. He was, a cor I think, a corporal or a sergeant or something like that um, because he didn't finish high school. Um, he had to drop out of high school because his, his, his dad died and he had to work to support his uh, siblings. Um, so because he didn't graduate high school, he was not eligible for the officer corps. So, you know, he kind of got put into the cannon fodder category, <laughs> basically. Um, but then just randomly they gave him this test. He was transferred to British intelligence in London. That's where he met my grandmother. Um, but uh, he, he had PTSD next level. Like, next level. I mean, just didn't talk. Just didn't talk. And if you tried talking to him, he'd just tell you to shut up. And he won a bunch of medals. Never never bragged about it once. Not, not even hinted. Nothing. I like found out about it because I, his military records were online. That's, uh, that's how, well, how I know. So, he would say, like, no no way in hell do you want to do, do that again. But how many people... Um, now, he, he obviously... He, now, he died you know, 20 years ago, or longer actually, 30 years ago. Um, how many people are alive that remember World War II? Not many. And the same perhaps applies to the threat of nuclear war. I mean, there are enough nuclear bombs pointed at the uh, United States to make the rubble, the radioactive rubble bounce many times. Elon Musk's concerns are not just about the future of humanity, but also the consequences of other wars. There's two major wars going on right now. So you talked about the threat of AGI quite a bit. But now, as we sit here with the intensity of conflict going on, do you worry about nuclear war? I think we shouldn't discount the possibility of nuclear war. Um, it is a civilizational threat. Um, I think the, the, the current probability of nuclear war is quite low. Um, but there are a lot of nukes pointed at us. So, and we have a lot of nukes pointed at other people. They're still there. Nobody's put their uh, their guns away. The, the missiles are still in the silos. Elon Musk is trying to alert the people about the consequences of war. And uh, the leaders don't seem to be the ones with the nukes talking to each other. No. There are wars which are tragic and difficult on a, on a local basis. And then there are wars which are civilization ending or has that potential obviously global thermonuclear warfare has high potential to end civilization perhaps perhaps permanently but certainly you know to severely uh wound and, and perhaps uh set back uh human progress by you know to the stone age or something i don't know pretty bad Probably scientists and engineers want to be super popular after that as well. <laughs> They're like, you got us into this mess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Generally, I think we, we obviously want to prioritize civilizational risks over things that are um, painful and tragic on, on a local level, but not civilizational. How do you hope the war in Ukraine comes to an end? And what's the path, once again, to minimizing human suffering there? Uh, well, I think that what, what is likely to happen uh, which is really pretty much the, the way it is, is that um, something very close to the current lines uh, will be how a ceasefire or truce happens. But, you know, you, you just have a situation right now where whoever goes on the offensive um, will suffer casualties at several times the rate of whoever's on the defense. Because mm -hmm. um, you've got... Uh, Defense in depth, you've got minefields, uh, trenches, anti-tank defenses. Um, nobody has air superiority because um, the, the, the anti-aircraft missiles are really far better than the, the aircraft. Like, there are far more of them. Um, and uh, so neither side has uh, air superiority. Um, tanks are basically death traps, um, just slow moving, and they're, they're not immune to anti-tank weapons. So you, you really just have long-range artillery, um, and uh, infantry. 
trenches. It's World War One, all over again, mm-hmm. with drones. You know, throwing old drones, some some drones there, um, which makes the long range artillery just that much more accurate and yeah. better, and so more efficient at murdering people on both sides. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's whoever is you don't you don't you don't want to be trying to advance uh, from either side because the probability of dying is incredibly high. Um, so in order to overcome uh, defense in depth trenches and minefields, you really need a significant local superiority in numbers. Um, ideally, combined arms, where where you you do a fast attack with aircraft a concentrated number of tanks um, and a lot of people. That's the only way you're going to punch through a line. And then you're going to punch through and st- and, and then not have the reinforcements just kick you right out again. I mean, if, if you, I, I really recommend people read uh, World War One warfare in detail. It's rough. Um, I mean, the sheer number of people that died there was mind-boggling and it's almost impossible to um imagine the end of it that doesn't look like almost exactly like the beginning in terms of what land belongs to who and so on but on the other side of a lot of human suffering death yes and destruction of infrastructure yes i mean the thing that the reason i i you know proposed a a, some sort of truce or, or or peace a year ago was because I predicted pretty much exactly what would, would happen, uh, which is a lot of people dying for basically almost no changes in land. Um, and this, the, the, the loss of the, the flower of Ukrainian and Russian youth, and we should have some sympathy for the, the Russian boys as well as the Ukrainian boys, because the Russian boys didn't, didn't ask to be on their front line. They have to be. So. Um, there's a lot of sons not, not coming back to their parents, you know, and, and I think most of them don't, don't really have, they don't hate the other side, you know, it's sort of like, there's this saying about, like this, this saying comes from World War One. it's like, young boys who don't know each other, killing each other on behalf of old men that do know each other. The hell's the point of that? Elon Musk is very concerned about the future of the young generation. Look, I think I would just recommend do not send the flower of Ukrainian youth to be to die uh, in trenches. Uh, whether he talks to Putin or not, just don't do that. Um, whoever goes on the offensive will lose massive numbers of people. Um, and history will not look kindly upon them. Elon Musk is very concerned about the future of the young generation, and his concern extends to big countries around the world, like China. You've spoken honestly about the possibility of war between U.S. and China in the long term, if no diplomatic solution is found. For example, on the question of Taiwan and one China policy. Right. How do we avoid the trajectory where these two superpowers clash? Well, it's it's worth reading that book on the, the uh, difficult to pronounce, Thucydides Trap, I believe it's called. I love war history. I like inside out and backwards. Um, there's hardly a battle I haven't read, read about. And, and trying to figure out like what, what really was the cause of victory in any particular case, as mm-hmm. opposed to what one side or another claimed was the, the reason. Both the victory and what sparked the war. And yeah, yeah. The whole thing. That Athens and Sparta is a classic case. The thing about the Greeks is they really wrote down a lot of stuff. They loved writing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are lots of interesting things that happen in many parts of the world, but they just, people just didn't write it down. <laughs> so we don't know what happened, or they didn't really write with in detail. They just would say like, "We went, we had a battle, and we won." And like, well, what? Can you add a bit more? Um, <laughs> the, the, the Greeks, they really wrote a lot. <laughs> they were very articulate. On they just love writing. So, mm-hmm. and we have a bunch of that writing that's preserved. So we know what led up to the uh, Peloponnesian War between. Um, the Spartan and Athenian alliance. Um, and uh, we, we know that they, they, for quite, they, they saw it coming. I mean, the Spartans didn't write 
they, they also weren't very verbose by their nature. But they did right, but they weren't very verbose. <laughs> yeah, they were terse. Uh, but the, the Athenians and the other Greeks wrote, wrote a line. And they were like... Um, and Sp Sparta was really kind of like the leader of, of Greece. Um, but, but Athens grew stronger and stronger with each passing year. And, um, and everyone's like, well, that's inevitable that there's going to be a clash between Athens and Sparta. Uh, well, how do we avoid that? And they couldn't, they couldn't, they actually, they saw it coming and they still could not avoid it. <laughs> so, you know, at some point, if there's, if, if one uh, group, one civilization or, or country or whatever, um, exceeds another, sort of like if, you know, the United States has been the biggest kid on the block for, since I think around 1890 f from an economic standpoint. So the United States has been the economic, most powerful economic engine in the world longer than anyone's been alive. Um, and the foundation of war is economics. So now we have a situation in the case of China where the, um, the economy is likely to be two, perhaps three times larger than that of the US. So imagine you're the biggest kid on the block for as long as anyone can remember, and suddenly a kid comes along who's twice your size. So, um, now China, um, historically has always been, with rare exception, been internally focused. Um, they've not been acquisitive. Uh, they've, they've fought each other. There have been many, many civil wars. Um, in the three kingdoms war, I believe they lost about 70% of their population. So, and, and that does, so the, they've had brutal internal wars. Like civil wars that make the U.S. civil war look t small by comparison. Um, so it, I think it's important to appreciate that China is not uh, monolithic. Mm -hmm. um, we sort of think of like China as a sort of one entity of one mind, and this is definitely not the case. Um, from what I've seen, and I think most people who understand China would agree, that people in China think about China 10 times more than they think about anything outside of China. So it's like 90% of their consideration is, uh, you know, our, is, is, is internal. Well, isn't that a really positive thing when you're talking about the collaboration and a future peace between superpowers when you're inward facing, which is like focusing on improving yourself versus focusing on, yeah, uh, quote unquote, improving others through military might. The good news, the history of China suggests that China is not acquisitive, meaning they're not going to go out and invade a whole bunch of countries. Um, now, they do feel very strongly, you know, so that's that's good. I mean, because a, a lot of very powerful countries have been acquisitive. Mm -hmm. um, the, the U.S. is one of the, also one of the rare cases that has not been acquisitive. Like, in, after World War II, the U.S. could have basically taken over the world and any country. Like, we got nukes, nobody else got nukes. We don't even have to lose soldiers. Uh, which country do you want? Mm -hmm. And the United States could have taken over everything. Oh, it, at will. And it didn't. Um, and the United States actually helped rebuild countries. So it helped rebuild Europe. You know, it helped rebuild Japan. Um, this is very unusual behavior. Almost unprecedented. Um, you know, the U.S. did conspicuous acts of kindness. Like the Berlin airlift. You know. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, there's, it's always like, well, America's done bad things. Well, of course, America's done bad things, but one needs to look at the, uh, the whole track record. Um, and, and just generally, you know, one, one sort of test would be, how do you treat your prisoners of war? Mm -hmm. Or let's say, um, you know, no offense to the Russians, but let's say you're in Germany. It's 1945. You got the Russian army coming on one side. And you got the French, British, and American armies coming on the other side. Who would you like to be to surrender to? Like, no country is like morally perfect, but I recommend uh, being a POW with the Americans. That would be my choice. 